So, this is my advisor, introduce Philip Kunde from Nickelodeon University in Krakow, who will talk about Kupman Packard's uh, theorem uh, for linear least squares prediction of a linear time series. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to also. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I, I, do suggest I want to talk about a, yeah, a recent project uh, where kind of two worlds meet. On the one hand, uh, Koopman formalism from ergodic theory, and then Darkens celebrated embedding theorem. And uh, yeah, so I know that there have been a lot of talks in the seminar on uh, this field of Darkens theorem and uh, data driven prediction of dynamic systems. But let me still give you a brief outline of the questions that we. Uh, yeah, want to look at. Um, okay, so on one hand, you have some underlying dynamics T, uh, where okay, maybe the exact form of the dynamics is not known to you. And then you have uh, an observable F from your A space X to uh, complex numbers or probably for physical observability will restrict to all the real value. Observe it. And uh, yeah, the, the general goal is kind of to, to make a prediction out of, so you look at your measurements under your observable uh, F. Uh, and so we have a kind of the, the time series under our observable F. And uh, we evaluate observable as the, uh, as the iterates of our dynamics, and we want to kind of make a prediction for the next entry in our uh, time series. And uh, yes, yeah, I'm asking the question of which pairs of dynamics D and observable F can we predict? Which types of dynamics, which types of observable? We have a good chance of making a, a good prediction. Yes. And uh, in the second part, we also want to look at some uh, quantities that are kind of relevant in the analysis of, of time series. Um, yeah, I will go into those details uh, later. And of course, this is a field with wide uh, reaching applications, uh, like forecasts, uh, of course, weather, financial markets, uh, social behavior conflicts, epidemic spreading. And those are also kind of fit well into this framework here that okay, usually you don't have a, a good understanding of the underlying uh, dynamics, but you, you just have your observations and want to make predictions out of those observed uh, problems. And uh, yeah, this kind of why this field of, of data driven prediction is so, so relevant and important because they are really, uh, yeah, you can ask about the qualities of your underlying models that if you describe here the dynamics T and also maybe the exact form of the observables might not known to you or you have some room to modify the observable, so that's why it comes that's kind of relevant also to, to ask this question, okay, now how generic is a collection of pairs of dynamics and observables that you can uh, predict? And of course one yeah, celebrated theorem in that direction that uh, is often used for motivation or even heuristic explanation of how to approach those prediction problems is uh, Tarkin's uh, theorem. And yeah, I know that there are a lot of uh, additional versions of it, but I said uh, the, the original one for the moment, and later on we'll talk about some of its extension generalizations. And yeah, so Tarkin's original theorem is kind of Phase space, you have a compact manifold of dimension m. 
and the set of pairs of mappings and observe this, where here our mapping should be a C2 diffeomorphism of the manifold, and as the observable, you also uh, get the C2 observables from the phase space, so from the manifold to the wheels. And we ask, and then, yeah, so we set up those pairs of dynamics and observable for which the following delay coordinate map is an embedding. Is open and dense with respect to the C and C1 uh, topology. So, yeah, here we, we, we look at this time delayed uh, mapping. So, where we take the, uh, yeah, it's on 2m plus 1 entries in our uh, time series. So, 2m plus 1 observations under this observability. And yeah, the uh, kind of the fact that, or the, that this is an embedding allows you, at least in theory, to do this kind of reconstruction step to go back from your uh, 2m plus 1 dimensional vector here to your uh, point x. So it's a so called reconstruction step. And yeah, if you can do this reconstruction step, then in total, this kind of sequence or this concatenation of steps is a one to one uh, map. So, from our observation sequence here, we can identify the, the underlying uh, point X, we we'll apply our diffeomorphism T on it, and then that the yeah uh, time uh, delay coordinate coordinates uh, for that base point tx. So this whole coordination is then what uh, one to one mapping, and in general, then this one here, this kind of shift in the time indices becomes a, a one to one. Uh, map. So in that sense, this the fact that this is an embedding, yeah, allows you to to make your prediction for the next uh, step. Yeah, so if this is an embedding, then we have predictability. We uh, need next uh, value in R as uh, x. But this is kind of uh, Stronger than one would actually need because for if we just think about predictability, so you want to predict the next entry in your time series, then for instance, if your observable is just a constant function, or here I put the constant function equal to zero, then I'm always able to, to predict the next entry, but this definitely is not an embedding in the sense of, of targets here. So the Parkins theorem in that sense is a stronger statement than what we would need for, for the prediction problem. But uh, yeah, it is kind of maybe closer in the spirit of really kind of reconstructing the, the whole uh, <coughs> um, So yeah, kind of the uh, visualization of Parkins theorem. Okay, maybe we just look here at the left. A triangle here would really be okay. You have here your, your unknown dynamical system, although it looks quite like the Lorentz attractor, but okay, it's, it's unknown to us, let's say. And uh, so we have some observable, uh, which in this case would just be the, the x coordinate uh, of your three dimensional uh, uh, dynamical system here. So if you look at the x coordinate and have now here our time series of observations of the x coordinate. And then, uh, yeah, kind of, we can build this kind of delay coordinate system where we, okay, here we look at time steps of length uh, 10 and have then the three consecutive moments from our time series and plot them here now in this three-dimensional plot and we get a kind of reconstruction of our original dynamics. So this 
map here would be this map from um, uh, this map file. So of course uh, the general question is so if you have such an unknown dynamic system, maybe okay, so you know the dimension of the phase space, maybe you don't, uh, maybe you care about the attractors and the dimension of that one is not known. So there are of course a lot of uh, questions when trying to apply uh, targets here in, in the application. Uh, yeah, regarding this uh, genericity of good pairs, let's say, of dynamics and observables, as I mentioned in the introduction, here we, we have a kind of notion of largeness is that in target zero, namely that it works for an open and dense uh, collection of dynamics and observables. And yeah, later on, we would see that there are uh, generalizations of Tarkin's theorem regarding then also this notion of, of largeness. But yeah, in his original work, kind of it is on this open and dense collection of, uh, of X. Um, so yeah, it's kind of this the fact that this is an embedding holds for yeah, a generic pair of dynamics and observables. And uh, you can have a, it's even a kind of a criterion or a specific way to check whether a specific dynamic system T uh, satisfies the conclusion of Tarkin's uh, theorem. Namely, if the diffeomorphism T has finitely many periodic points of period at most 2m, and for any such periodic point of period, and most to them, and the eigenvalues are all distinct. And for those, if you have in T, the conclusion that this is an embedding for an open and dense collection of observables holds. So, kind of okay, this version here allows you kind of, so if you have a precise form of your dynamic system, then Okay, you could check whether it satisfies this, this property here, and then uh, you would know that, okay, this conclusion uh, holds. While, of course, here for this general statement, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you only know that it works generically, but if you have a specific dynamic system at hand, then you, you don't know if it, if it actually holds. Uh, yeah, regarding the application of that, I mean, as I indicated, I mean, target theory is used as kind of, yeah, heuristic explanation or motivation for a lot of algorithms and schemes in data driven prediction of dynamic grid system. And, uh, yeah, put a couple of uh, words here, uh, kind of, yeah, uh, the goal that is about to kind of to learn the, uh, Kind of this time made coordinate map to make then also prediction for the for the next time set. Of course, uh, the problem, as I indicated, becomes okay. Maybe the dimension is not known to you. Maybe that dimension is, is very large. So then, this time delayed coordinate map becomes even uh, even higher dimension. So uh, this might become a real burden in, in computation and. And of course, the general relation is, is nonlinear. And there are no, no further details on kind of structure of this, uh, of this relation uh, phi here. So it's for, for learning it, it becomes really a, a burden. I mean, it could be computative expensive. And uh, yeah, and then regarding precise statements or convergent results, it also gets, yeah, there are not <laughs> many results known. Uh, and so it's, it's more like a, it's a heuristic explanation or a path <laughs> forward to, to do it based on this underlying target theory, but yeah, it's not really, let's say, uh, mathematically checked or proven that those algorithms really, really work. So in, yeah, so in work with figure called Taiwi, we look at the 
simpler <laughs> algorithm, let's say, to, to make predictions. Namely, we go to the to the linear, uh, or we make a linear attempt, and it's kind of comes under the name of Wiener filter. Those are yeah, things back to the very old work by by Wiener, but also already appears in work by Kolmogorov, where one says that okay, if you have some of your previous observations, in this case we take D, and you now want to determine coefficients C such that the average error between your next observation and this and your linear approximation becomes the uh, So it's kind of a linear regression model where you yeah, determine these coefficients here such that this error uh, becomes uh, minimum. And yeah, of course. Is small t uh, positive? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, yeah. So we, we take a. Oh, okay. So, uh, so t or d? Uh, t, small t. Small t, yeah. So, no, so small d is obviously positive. Well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and t, I mean, it's kind of okay. You have maybe this, this very long time series of, okay, okay. of your observations, and then at each point you. you Yes, I mean it, yes. it doesn't okay. matter for the, okay. the for the process at all. I mean it's just that you okay, you have your enumeration of your observations and uh, yeah. It looks like this notation name exclamation mark. Ah yeah, so this yeah, I, I agree, but this <laughs> so this is the kind of the notation and optimization that one tries to find the minimizer of this optimization problem. So one tries to find the coefficients c, or in this case, and it is the d-dimensional vector of your coefficient c, such that this left-hand side becomes minimal. Because sometimes exclamation mark is used to say that something is unique. Do you hear that? Uh, yeah, so under some uh, assumptions on the underlying dynamics, you actually you get uniqueness uh, here as well, yes, yes. But exactly. Um, yeah, good point. I mean, yeah. So for uh, for the part that we consider later on, we actually we will have uniqueness on this on that uh, level. Uh, yes. Do these coefficients C depend on X? Uh, yeah. And in you want theory, them not to depend. No, I mean in theory they they could depend on the point X. And uh, yeah, so now uh, kind of <laughs> yeah, we have exactly that position. Kind of how much does it depend on the on the base point and so on. So if we now kind of are in a nice setting and we can apply the the ergodic uh, theorem and we we do some pre-indexing here, then in the end it turns kind of we get this. Uh, ergodic limit of this optimization problem. And yeah, so now this, this other actor from the title of the talk, namely the, the Koopman operator, uh, enters the stage. Uh, oh, so the, could you please yeah. uh, explain uh, what, what, so ergodic limit, uh, you take limit when... Uh, so we, we kind of... Uh, we let now this uh, t kind of get well, kind of we look at a longer and longer time series, but each time we look at this uh, window of uh, yeah, or what we kind of call delay depth uh, d. Yeah. So that part uh, stays the same. It's just that kind of our whole trajectory that we look at and where we make our apply our scheme that one gets gets longer and longer. Say that X is generic, it's a body, and X small yeah, is generic. Yes. So, yeah, now we kind of yeah, introduce here this other <laughs> main actor from the, the title, namely the, the, the Koopman operator, which, uh, yeah, apply here on A2 observables. 
and is it just uh, the composition operator? So you compose your observable with your underlying dynamics T. So this is an uh, check that this is a unitary operator, and actually that the Koopman operator of the inverse of T turns out to be the inverse <coughs> of the Koopman operator of T. That yeah, so if I take here the uh, observable, which is a constant function one, then okay, under the Koopman <coughs> operator, so if I compose the <coughs> dynamics, it still stays the same uh, function. And uh, yeah, <coughs> the spectrum, we can check that this is actually then just the point part and the continuous part, so there is no residual spectrum. And uh, yeah, the spectrum is contained in the, in the unit uh, surface. Um, yeah, and in our, I mean, slide later, Kind of uses following projective interpretation. So we look at the d dimensional uh, space here, which is the span of the yeah, observable and uh, the uh, d, uh, d minus one previous observations. So the composition with d minus i up to uh, d minus one. So maybe these are the functions that appear here in, in our uh, expression. So and this, uh, and then we look at the projection of our Koopman operator on that uh, d-dimensional uh, space. So if you kind of then want to give a representation of our uh, scheme here, then what's going to happen is, of course, that for the, for the function here, yeah, under the application of your dynamics T, you just, you know, your base vectors move uh, one step further. And for F composed with T, yeah, okay, we make this approximation here. So we want to find, and since we do this, projection here, so we want to find uh, this is exactly the, the best approximation. And uh, question. Yes. Yes. Uh, so for UG to be well defined, you need uh, some sort of statement about pred predictability or uh, kind of seconds? Uh, yeah, so for the moment I will just kind of formulate it as a, as a general problem, and but it could be, of course, at this stage, could be very bad uh, <laughs> approximation, or I mean, it's, it's, uh, we are not saying, I mean, at this point, it's just setting up the, the scheme or the algorithm. And then later on, we will try to say some statement that under what assumptions can you get a good approximation and uh, what do you need for that, let's say. But uh, in general, I mean, I can always kind of uh, look at this uh, d-dimensional space here and, and look at the projection. So uh, maybe in the end, this <laughs> isn't a good approximation to our Koopman operator. But the, the hope is, of course, that kind of if you let your delay depth d to be large enough or in the, in the limit, maybe you get a, a good approximation. But it is not clear at all. And we will need assumptions to, to get that. But to set up the, the scheme here, you can do uh, in any case. But, but it seems you are assuming they are independent. Uh, what are assuming that f comma blah 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 they are all independent. So if one uh, so for this if I if I want to consider it as a basis, then I would need uh, independence. Yes, but uh, yeah, that's uh, but otherwise uh, to define u d, so we take a vector from this k d. It can it's uh, represented as a linear combination of. Uh, this type of yeah, yeah, but then it would not necessarily be unique. But I mean, so I, I could, it's still, I could do some representation also just based on those uh, observables. And, okay, I get, but this would then not, not be a unique representation. 
Uh, yeah, so, so my question previously was about uh, well, uh, whether UD is uh, well defined, whether uh, it depends on the choice uh, of representation of your vector in your combination. Of yes, yes, yes. So, okay. we, but for the ones that we consider, we will get uniqueness, but yeah, it's, it's not okay. well. And now I get your, your question regarding uniqueness. Yeah, it's, it's not. Okay. Uh, but for, yeah, the standard projection by this operator here, yeah, you could. Okay. Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. So okay, we are basically in that uh, situation that uh, okay. So I, I kind of rewrite our observation sequence and our aim now kind of by by looking or by using the, the Koopman operator in our uh, notation. So here we okay. Basically here we have the observations not written in the, in the past and want to predict the next uh, entry in our uh, time series and we write this with the Kuhlman operator so and this just means that this would be f of t of x and uh, here on the left hand side we yeah, you know, okay, apply the inverse of the Kuhlman operator and recall that this was then actually the Kuhlman operator of t inverse one of our properties here, so that if you apply the inverse of your Koopman operator, that this is the uh, Koopman operator of uh, the inverse of t. So, and uh, yeah, here we have this, uh, our space is KD, so it often come under the name Krilov space, and yeah, if those are linear independent, then this, they are a, a basis of this so-called d-dimensional Krilov space. And uh, yeah, for us, or we, we kind of, uh, the starting point for our investigation was kind of the concept of a, of a cyclic vector for, for an operator. And in this case, we, we asked for a cyclic, that f is a so-called cyclic vector of u inverse. And okay, what is the, the definition of a cyclic vector? Is that if I look at these finite dimensional spans here and I take their union, so I take the union over uh, D, so that then that they lie dense in L2. So with the iterations of my cyclic vector f under the operator, so in this case the operator is u inverse, but then I can basically, yeah, that span approximates everything in my L2. So it yeah, um, fits up to, to the whole uh, function space. So I can approximate every L2 function very well, by things in the span of my uh, of the images of my observable under the, the operator here. And uh, okay, the, the relevance for, for our for the question of okay, or, or why are these cyclic vectors relevant to us uh, in this setting is okay, so if F is a cyclic vector of u inverse, then this error between our uh, projectivized operator ud and the actual operator goes to zero when the delay depth d goes to infinity. So the, yeah, the translated statement into our prediction problem or the forecast problem then we would say that the mean squared forecast error yeah, goes to zero when our uh, delay depth increases. But this goes from ergodistic? Uh, no, this is kind of by, okay, I know I have this one <laughs> proof here. Wow. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, short proof. It's basically, it is a definition of a cyclic vector. Namely, yeah. that the cyclic vector tells you that you uh, yeah, approximate the whole uh, L2. So, yeah, 
Uh, so that is uh, by definition, uh, the f is a simple vector gives you here that okay this um, nested subspaces KD uh, approximate more and more and fill the, the whole entry and then calling it the kind of the if I look at the orthogon the <laughs> com complement of my projection then. Uh, that goes point by to zero. Okay, so if this is a cyclic vector, then uh, so I have to, my, my question is two parts. First, do we know uh, now that the, this uh, this vector of C's exists and it's uh, there's only one vector C that minimizes the, the, the yes, cyclic. yes. So if if you have a cyclic vector, yeah. then those have to be uh, independent okay. because yeah. otherwise you, you would yeah. uh, okay. you wouldn't be able to spend the whole. Uh, space uh, or approach space or whole space because you would always stick them in the, the finite dimensional subspace. So, uh, so the, the fact that this is a cyclic vector gives you the, the linear independence. Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, so this was kind of the, the starting point or this said, okay, this kind of cyclic vectors they are kind of uh, relevant or they would be. An important tool to uh, for our prediction uh, prop, and yeah, that's why we kind of introduce as a notion then uh, this okay that you say okay a pair of dynamics t and uh, and two observable f is called strongly asymptotically linearly and uh, too predictable if F is a cyclic vector for Q uh, T inverse. Okay, so yeah, this long acronym here, and I will, will not mention it uh, very often anymore, because, but it's kind of okay. Uh, yeah, linearly predictable because we, we use this linear filter, the Wiener filter, then asymptotically, yeah, because here in this works when the delay depth goes to uh, infinity. Um, so, yeah, forecast error vanishes uh, in the asymptotic limit. Okay, L2, because we, yeah, this should be an L2 uh, vector or function. And, uh, yeah, then the strongly, uh, we add it because, yeah, in some sense, a weaker notion would also suffice for the sense of this prediction, namely, I mean, for that it would be. Good enough if you knew that the that your UF lies in this uh, closure here. So maybe it's not necessarily the whole L2, but as long as you you would be able to guarantee that your UF always lies in that, you could also make this uh, forecast error going to, to zero. But uh, yeah, so that's why we kind of have this also this weaker notion of uh, weak predict predictability. Uh, and this one, the difference to that is they call it uh, strong. And also, <laughs> depending on the time, I might say a couple of words on weak predictability, but we we'll focus on strongly predictable the main part of the, of the talk. And yeah, we again, again ask this question of, okay, how large is this collection of pairs or of yeah, predictable pairs, so of dynamics and observable. So okay, how large is a collection of uh, measure-preserving transformations T that have a cyclic vector F? Uh, and then for those, how large is the collection of cyclic vectors? And uh, yeah, so couple of results in that direction, and then the first one is kind of as in, in the spirit of, of Tarkin's original result, kind of on the genericity of predictable pairs. And okay, for that I have to describe the topology on uh, our collection of transformations. So in this case, so in, in Tarkin's theorem, he worked on the C2 diffeomorphisms and used the C1 topology, and here we are talking about measure-preserving transformations, so I first have to describe the topology on the measure-preserving transformations that I'm 
working with and okay generate that also regarding the phase space we consider here the complete and separable probability space without atoms so kind of theoretically isomorphic with unit interval with Corel, sigma also Corel, uh, algebra and measure is a standard bank measure and the, the weak topology on the measure preserving transformation is given as follows so a sequence of measure preserving transformation tn converges to a measure preserving transformation t in the weak topology if for every set e in our sigma algebra the symmetric difference between the image under tn and t goes to, to zero yeah, so for kind of for every set in our sigma algebra there's an error between the image under tn and the image under the limit transformation goes to and yeah, okay, why the name weak topology? Because yeah, this is kind of uh, equivalent to convergence in the weak operator topology, but it's actually also equivalent to convergence in the strong operator topology. So it's a bit of a <laughs> strange uh, thing here, but uh, yeah, so I put so of this, yeah, takes back to the yeah, it's groundbreaking work of Almos or that his book. I mean, very nice description of that. Do you assume that the T are uh, inversible? Yes, uh, good point. I, I, I skipped it. It was mentioned somewhere, but I, I didn't uh, mention it yet. So we uh, assume that there's an essential bijection. So ignoring the set of measure zero, but there should be uh, bijections. Exactly, yeah. Good point. Uh, well, uh, yeah, later on, uh, yeah, ask some questions in that direction. Yeah, but at this point, yeah, we, uh, we assume that these are invertible measure preserved. <coughs> okay, then our uh, kind of uh, first result in that direction comes the following. So we, we assume that we have a, a standard probability space. And then the collection of measure preserving transformations with a generic set of asymptotically linear predictable observables is generic in MPT with a weak uh, topology. Or in other words, for generic transformations, they have generic collection of cyclic vectors in L2. Now we are here and uh, we use the following notion of genericity, namely yeah, as a, that it contains a dense G delta set. So uh, now we're G delta set is this countable intersection of, of open sets. So it's, it's a weaker generosity notion than in Tarkins. It talks about open and dense. We we use yeah, this uh, notion. Containing a dense uh, G deltas. So let me give you these some ideas of, the, of that proof. I mean, uh, some part I wrote to the paper, but let's say, okay, so in general, to, to set up that, okay, we want to uh, show this genericity, so we have this countable intersection of open and dense sets, so yeah, we will end up here with a there's a long intersection of some <laughs> complicated uh, sets, but it's kind of yeah, uh, constructive proof in, in that sense, but uh, still then very hard to check for a given transformation whether the actual statement uh, holds. So, okay, so, so ideas of the proof, okay, let's fix kind of the you can count how the dense set in L2, so we denote those by FJ, and then okay, we will look at the following sets here, the following uh, neighborhoods in uh, the measure preserving transformations. So they are 
or uh, two of them of the g and then positive integers m and n. We have the following sets, namely the collection of transformations where there exists such a uh, numbers uh, lambda such that we can approximate our i-th element in our countable collection here in the precision of 1 over m by yeah, looking at such a yeah, linear combination of yeah, iterations under of this observable g. Is it the same as saying that uh, each of i uh, lies on distance uh, most one of our m from the space generated by UDKG? Uh, yes. Okay. Of the span of that. Uh, but it's not each because. I no, so I mean, here I, I, I fix. Here I fix ah, that given i. I. Okay. Yeah. So for for that particular set here, mm -hmm. I I look at one particular element f i, but then later on, of course, I will make intersection to to get it for for every uh, element uh, f j in my my sequence here. But yeah, at this point I I fix the uh, f i and I look at those transformations. Such that okay, the, uh, the span of the those iterates g approximate my fi. So then now kind of yeah, here now you see this. Uh, the next step is kind of okay. We take the intersection over okay, the first n elements in our. Um, uh, secrets here. So now we okay <coughs> those transformations where okay for the first n entries in our countable collection here we, we get the approximation by the span of the iterates of G. So and that okay still uh, oh yeah here to, to check that this is an open neighborhood yeah we, we kind of use this equivalent characterization of the, the weak topology that actually yeah, was also um, converged or closeness in the weak topology referred also to closeness in the, in the strong uh, operator. So and then we, yeah, as I <laughs> warned you, one takes this uh, long, uh, oh yeah, this intersection over some union, so and then we have to check that this really does the job, so, but let me give you the, the idea why it does the job. I mean, of course here, so this, this couple of intersections are really okay. So on the one hand, we want to get arbitrary precision in our approximation, so that is taken care of the n. Then here the intersection over the n is so that we yeah, exhaust our whole uh, countable collection of fj's here. Well, because here these sets here they approximated up to the first n uh, entries and we want to of course approximate the whole dense set and if we have done so then we are dense in the whole uh, l2 and uh, yeah okay and here so we also really want that those alleged or this claimed cyclic vectors g i mean basically what we want to do is we want to show that uh, or you want to use this g as an approximation to a cyclic vector yeah i mean that's what's going on here because we look at the the iterates of that g and you know, then with the linear combinations out of those uh, iterates and yeah we want to show that now basically our goal here we call is to show that also the collection of cyclic vectors is generic uh, yeah so you uh, you use this part here to show that okay basically close to every element of our uh, countable collection here again in arbitrary <laughs> precision taken care of by this intersection 
you will find uh, a cyclic vector uh, G. So, of course, uh, there are a lot of people to check that this really does the job so that the transformations T that lie in this uh, intersection, that they really have a countable and dense connection of cyclic vectors, but the, the heuristic idea is that, okay, those union leaves at these intersections here take care of that the uh, that the that this uh, collection that we build up here is a generic uh, collection, and this intersection here take care of that uh, this collection of cyclic vectors for that transformation t becomes a generic uh, set in that. Okay. Yeah, okay, probably you're shocked by this. <laughs> uh, but okay, so this is the, the, the okay, maybe okay. I don't know. Are that crazy or should I? Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, just on the sense so for each fixed M M T S capital M, first you uh, find now uh, you take union over all uh, G goes to this fixed F S. Yeah, so this is, exactly. So here I I look. Okay, I want to show that in this one over t uh, neighborhood that I find a, a cyclic vector, let's say, mm -hmm. and this is kind of guaranteed here. Then uh, okay, I take this intersection over t. So the closer I get, uh, I mean, still I find a g close to my f s such that this. Uh, Approximation, so this this linear span is yeah, one over m uh, closed. So, uh, but initially, so do, uh, the transparency is that this union uh, over g goes to f s will be uh, open and dense. Uh, which one? So, this so here it's still here. still open, but I mean, in the end, since we take this other intersection, we cannot. Uh, Guarantee that at the end this stuff is still open. Yeah. This is not. We are just showing that this is a, a dense G delta set. So but I mean, I I have that these are open and dense. Yeah, that's right. But then I take these countable intersections and uh, so the, the the how how we need to show that this is dense. Yes. Second. Uh, ah no. But, uh, so I mean, for that I mean. Uh, So this is kind of the core showing that this uh, initial yes. uh, yeah, yeah. union is dense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's just that the definition. Right, right. So there's a question. So this is if the close to our Yeah, and for, for denses then I mean we will see that also the next time we will also we build on high most conjugacy lemma. So if you have one a periodic map and you look at the conjugates of that one then this will give you a dense collection. I will come to that in the next uh, next steps. But by the, the next time I will use that explicitly. But this is of course also kind of then the, the underlying part of the proof for for checking density or, or to, to guarantee density of this whole thing. In the end, is also when you basically you only need one upper map with a generic collection of Cyclic vectors, and then by Hamas controversy lemma, you will produce densities. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, since we are talking about this uh, genericity and uh, density data set, there is a. I mean, to me, it's, it's a very striking uh, mechanism or result that one can uh, transfer those. Genericity results for measure preserving transformations to genericity results for uh, homeomorphisms. And uh, so, okay, now the, the setup for the, that is a okay, compact connected manifold, and yeah, sometimes it's called an Oxley Ullum measure, or sometimes a good measure, namely those measures that are non atomic, locally positive. And zero on the, on the manifold boundary. And as a 
new uh, space of dynamical systems. We consider the space of <coughs> new preserving homeomorphisms of the manifold equipped with a uniform uh, topology. And then it is a, yeah, that's this uh, indicator that is yeah, striking in the light, so that if you are in this uh, setting of a good measure on such a compact connected manifold, and you have a conjugate invariant dense G delta subset of the measure preserving transformations with respect to the weak topology, then if you take the intersection with the homeomorphisms, that this is an, a dense G delta subset of, uh, yeah, in this space of new preserving homeomorphism with a uniform uh, topology. So you have a, a general transfer principle between genericity results from equity to uh, homeomorphism. And okay, so now on in our application, basically, or when we want to apply this general theorem, okay, one has to check that the collection of uh, MPTs with a dense set of cyclic vectors is conjugate invariant. But okay, this basically is just that you you also conjugate the, the, the cyclic vector. Uh, conjugate invariant means the conjugation by n map from the measure preserving exactly yes. I conjugate by a measure preserving transformation and it is still in this collection of measure preserving um, Yeah, and so then as a corollary, we basically can transfer our previous genericity statement to a genericity statement for in the space of homeomorphism. So okay, it is then this setup of compact connected manifold and a good measure, then the collection of better preserving homeomorphism with a dense delta set of cyclic vectors is a dense delta set in the space of homeomorphism with a uniform topology. So okay can we that part on uh, uh, genericity statements, then uh, in this uh, extension of generalizations of uh, Tarkin's work, uh, there is another concept or another concept of largeness was investigated, namely prevalence, which is kind of used to, to go, talk about almost everything in an infinite dimensional uh, setting, so descriptively speaking. So okay, what does prevalence require? So if you are in a, in a uh, vector space, you take a set S, and E is a finite dimensional so-called probe space. Then S is called prevalent. If for almost every point of V plus or a finite dimensional probe space, this belongs to, uh, to our co connection S that we are looking at for all base points B. Okay, so basically, okay. the set is called prevalent. If we are able to find such a finite dimensional probe space E, such that if you look at any Point B, and you look at the sum of V plus this probe space E, and then almost every point in this <laughs> space belongs to your set E, yes. Yeah. And so this, yeah, as I said, is kind of used as a, as a way to phrase almost everything in an infinite dimensional uh, set. Okay, and uh, with this notion we can show that okay, the collection of measure preserving transformations is a prevalent and dense delta set of cyclic vectors in a cube 
nice dance in the measure preserving transformation with respect to the weak topology. So here we, we don't get the uh, yeah, basic possible is true that we could uh, improve it in G delta then? Oh, uh, no, so that right. is not true. No, I I would conjecture that it, that it holds true. Uh -huh. And I agree we have some ideas how to approach it, but it's not uh, checked or written. But yeah, I would if I have to make a bet or a conjecture, I would uh, think that it actually yeah, holds true here with also this at least gen generic, uh, or maybe even prevalent. But okay, that one I'm not sure. But uh, for, for generic, I I would bet on prevalent. I don't know. But yeah, so we are only able to to show this part uh, so far that it's kind of density. Um, uh, but for each of these uh, MPTs from that set, uh, this set E will be different. Uh, the proper set. Yes. 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 MPT. Yes. Uh, yeah, because that refers and uh, just then, you know, okay, here for your, also the, the cyclic vectors could always depend on your given transformation. Okay. And how complicated it can be, uh, this, how large uh, uh, is it, uh, is there a chance to put a bound on it? Uh, on this ah, you want to have not, not so many cyclic vectors or not so many transformations or in which sense? Uh, the, uh, finite dimensional probe space. Uh, yeah. Uh, ah, so yeah, in our case, it was actually just uh, one dimension. I see. Good right. enough. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, because here you, you, you as, yeah, comes it, but let me just give a bit of the outline of the proof. So, how we approach that was, or it, so to, to get the density is exactly that what I indicated earlier, namely that we apply Halmos conjugacy lemma. So in fact, we we only proof or check for one map that we could get a prevalent set of cyclic vectors. And then we, uh, the easiest map to think of, namely uh, irrational rotation of the of the circle. And for that one, then okay. An hands on approach, based on Fourier uh, expansion, and so on, and could check that this irrational rotation, or independent of the rotation number, so we didn't use any further properties of the rotation number uh, besides irrationality, that that has a prevalent and dense genetic set of uh, cyclic vectors. And then, Heimer's conjugacy lemma. Which says that, okay, if you have a aperiodic measure preserving transformation, then in the weak topology, the set of transformations that are conjugate to that given aperiodic transformation T0, that one is dense in MPT. So then, yeah, basically, okay, we use this one, apply the, the conjugacy lemma, and get a dense. Collection of uh, those transformations. And if I remember, this conjugacy lemma is just this uh, Rochlin. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. I mean, the, the, the proof of the conjugacy lemma is, yeah, it's, and this is also, I mean, okay, so now I mentioned this strike in the homeomorphism case. I mean, of course, then what we try to do or have to do in the proof is basically, okay, you, you have the, the permutation of boxes in the, in the measure preserving sense and now you approximate this permutation by boxes by homeomorphism. You have to give up a bit on the on precision or you have some kind of turbulent zone where you don't have exact permutation but you you limit that domain of turbulent zone and try to mimic the Brockman's proof, let's say. Uh, yes. Yeah, so then, uh, yeah, and, okay, so this, uh, you, now you, you apply this uh, conjugacy stuff twice in the sense that on the one hand, you use this measure theoretic isomorphy between the backspace and your, your standard probability space, and uh, then here you apply the conjugacy lemma to, to get the density of uh, those uh, 
transformations rather than a set of uh, cyclic features. Okay, so uh, yeah, when we look at our uh, results, or some that I mentioned, some. So in particular, things look great for uh, torus translations, rotations, um, and so for those, there will be a huge class of predictable uh, observables. But there is also another nice class, let's say, for which we can check that uh, there are predictable observables, or we know that there are predictable observables, then that is this uh, yeah, important class in the economic theory of rank one systems. And yeah, there is a nice survey by Ferenczi on rank one systems, and it has a title of okay, the lecturer's nightmare to define uh, rank one. But uh, so let's say, descriptively speaking, okay, a rank one system is one where you Kind of, you have a sequence of partitions, and your partition is basically given by the levels of a tower, and that those approximate the whole sigma algebra. So we have a partitions of the form of a base state f, and then the iterates under our dynamics give the levels of the tower, and that this tower becomes uh, an approximation of the whole sigma algebra. So if we go to continue this process, then the sequence of partitions really converges to the uh, decomposition into forms. So these rank one systems, if you want to construct them, then it's really by, okay, you have a base set of the tower and several layers, and then you cut this one and, and build the next steps of the, of the tower. Um, so this is an yeah, important class in constructions in ergodic theory. It was used to produce a lot of counterexamples to, to older uh, conjectures, like the yeah, famous Chacon example. That was the first, I mean, it was an explicit example of a map that is weakly mixing but not mixing. And, and, so. and uh, yeah. Now, within this framework of the rank one systems, there is a celebrated result by, or construction by Olmsky, who constructed rank one systems that are mixing. So now, since, okay, we know or we checked in our paper that rank one systems all, always have cyclic vectors. So now that there are also, no, by Olmsky's result, there are mixing systems of rank one. So even for mixing systems, you could have cyclic vectors, so you could have prediction, which is maybe a bit surprising in the sense that, okay, what did we do in, in our prediction algorithm? Okay, we longer and longer delay that and use the previous observation to make a prediction for the next one. So for, for mixing, you would expect that you lose I mean, the further you go into, or the longer it gets, okay, the less relevant becomes your memory. And so, for that thing, it was not to expect that uh, for mixing systems, this delay depth going, going larger would help in making a prediction. But uh, yeah, it's good. So, I have two questions. Yeah. First of all, do you, can you generalize this to finite one? Uh, no, I don't. No, I mean, so for this, uh, and actually, I, I guess there are many countries of finite rank. I, no, I mean, for finite rank, I, I don't see a reason why they should have a cyclic rank. Okay, and my second question, continuing your heuristic, let's consider the Bernoulli system. Yeah. So immediately you see. No yeah, yeah. For, for Bernoulli, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course. It's not a cyclic vector or anything like that. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm not saying that every mixing system is predictable, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that there is, I mean, there is a particular class of mixing system that is also of rank one. Yeah, for those, uh, 
you can guarantee the existence of a cyclic vector and have to, it is predictable in our sense. But yeah, this is a restricted class of uh, within the collection of mixing systems. And of course, these examples by Bionsky, I mean, they are constructed, they are manufactured. And I mean, it's a complicated proof, uh, complicated construction. And so, in particular, they are not, not explicit in the sense that one could <laughs> try any numerics on them, or I mean, it's, uh, it's really. Yeah, manufactured by this cutting and stacking construction, and in fact, in that construction, you use a probabilistic approach, and so it's it's a very it's very influential construction and so on. But uh, yeah, for to apply it in our scheme, it's out of reach, let's say. But yeah, for the uh, yeah, to me, it's an <laughs> interesting fact that you can do such. Or you have such a prediction. Yeah, or oh, oh. so okay, now this we have this density statements or generosity statements, and also in some sense bad news uh, because okay, if you just look at the finite level of a of a filter, then at that stage you are not able to conclude anything about uh, whether uh, now your transformation is predictable or not, because close in any precision you want, you will find something close that is predictable. So on the, on the finite stage, you cannot uh, kind of uh, make a distinction between predictable systems and non-predictable systems just by looking at the, at the filter of that stage. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe I will not we will go into the details of that, but so in the analysis of, of time uh, series, one uh, thing that uh, one often checks are so called autocorrelation. So the correlation between your observation and the one sometimes that's uh, earlier uh, in our case. And uh, so this is a Error autocorrelation, and now we could then also look at this autocorrelation coming from our uh, our filter. Ah, and okay, we can check that as long so for for n at most the delay lengths of our filter, then okay, they are exactly the same, and uh, but we will also have some. Approximation results on the closeness of the outer correlation we get for our filter and the ones for the, the, the actual outer correlation. But now let me show you some pictures towards the end of the <laughs> talk. <laughs> and <it's, laughs> uh, so, okay, for the first example, let's really take this irrational uh, torus translation here. And uh, yeah, uh, let's, let's look at the left hand side first. Then we have this yeah, smooth observable. And yeah, we really see nicely that with the delay depth increasing, yeah, our error between our projected uh, coupon operator to the actual coupon operator, yeah, this error becomes yeah, that's the machine precision test. If we Take here an observable that is not smooth. So here we take the characteristic function uh, of, of the set, then I mean, we still get uh, yeah, approximation gets better and better, but it is a slower rate and it's, it's uh, also the, the precision itself is, is bad. So I mean, kind of the, one has, the delay depth has to get way larger to get the same precision as we. So kind of there, I mean, there is certainly something here kind of that depends on the regularity of your observer. But how do you get, I mean, do you have a problem that tells you that this S1 no. will be good or this was a no. guess? This was just a, a guess, I mean, exactly. So we are not, I mean, it's just, as in the, the targets, <laughs> or in application of target theorem, it's just, okay, for this one, we know that uh, basically, 
there is actually yeah, even a prevalent set of, of good observables. So if you pick one, I mean, it's, <laughs> you will <laughs> add on the, on the finite stage, of course, you, then you, yeah, it's, it's, everything is looking great. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, but no, that's a good point. I mean, we don't have a, uh, as in the target theorem, you, for the observables, you don't have a criterion that says to check whether or that observable actually works. I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, and uh, here now to get your figure of this uh, autocorrelation. Where you okay, yes, okay. See basically okay. So the red are the correct values of the autocorrelation, and uh, the, the black dots are the one that we get from our uh, filter. And here we would take a filter of the fixed delay length uh, twenty one. So up to this twenty one, okay, we have fully agree with each other. And then afterwards, I mean, it's still picking up the, the trend, let's say, but of course, the small uh, <coughs> deviations here, but kind of regarding the, the trend, I mean, or it's the, yeah, it also then you know, you get three times the value of your uh, delay. Uh, yeah, the second example here, let's look at the automator. Or, what for Neumann Kapitalis transformation, given in this form on the, on the as a interval map. And yeah, also here we kind of I mean this is also a discrete spectrum, but of course the spectrum is more complicated than for the uh, for our torus translation from the previous example. So you, you have yeah, slower um, convergence here. But also here for the other correlations, we still pick it up very well. And now, yeah, for this, for the Lorentz model, um, this mixing, uh, so here you see, okay, maybe first it looks great, but then yeah, you reach here uh, some constant level and your approximation does not get uh, any better. So it is not working uh, for, for the Lorentz. So, I mean, it works up to some precision here, but then uh, you don't get uh, better. And for the outer correlation, I mean, it, it also, you see that it starts to, to deviate. So just to check, so there's no cyclic vector? No. But this is a theorem? No, no, I mean, no, no. <laughs> uh, so, okay, it's not a theorem, but it's, we kind of we, we say okay no okay I can't say anything precise about that I can just say it's it's not covered by our theorems and uh, that in the positive sense and so uh, uh, yeah I mean in that sense it's very not surprising that this is not really working uh, I mean, this is not a contradiction to our theorems yeah. <laughs> What was the, the, the observable? Uh, okay, yeah, so the observable I, I tried to indicate here, it's kind of it's an observable that it's, it's a level function here, uh, whether it didn't become centered around uh, the center of this uh, one. But the distance to, to some point? Yeah, uh, it's to, the, to the center of the one wing of the, of the butterfly. You know, it's, Okay. Yeah, maybe let's uh, skip that part on, on weak predictability and just go into a summary of the uh, talk. So, I mean, uh, yeah, for the people in the audience, either online or in person, who know much more about the uh, Tarkin's theorem and its great progress and extensions with different notions of largeness and smoothness requirements. But yeah, yeah, if you just give a brief comparison between targets result and our kind of Kuhlmann targets result, of course, the, the one thing, I mean, in, in targets, kind of targets result and its generalizations kind of give you the idea that, okay, 
if your delay depth is sufficiently large, dependent on some qualities like dimension. Of course, there are different dimension concepts and different uh, statements in that direction, but in general, it would be good enough to find a sufficient large D, but still finite. And then Darkham theorem would give you the, the embedding uh, statement. While, okay, here in our case, we don't have any dimension concept, but anyway, we, we would, or we always have to choose this delay depth. I mean, it's an asymptotic uh, statement, so the delay depth. Yeah, so it's increased. But so, so to clarify, the larger D you get the better prediction yes. you get the statement? Yes, 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 yes. But it's not quantity. Yes, so that is one of the first questions that I would raise on the next slide is exactly what it is. Yeah, and then of course regarding smoothness or regularity, I mean besides from that transfer result. One of us works in the setting of just measurable uh, dynamics. Um, yeah, and that still is kind of, there is a particular collection of transformations where one, for which one kind of knows that uh, the conclusions uh, hold. So in targets cases, what is uh, on the uh, number of periodic points and then there are eigenvalues have uh, this thing, and here in our case, the transformation is this with spectrum a kind of uh, nice class. Of uh, yeah, so in the outlook, exactly. So, what was the first question would be okay, can you? I mean, our techniques of result, they just show kind of convergent result, but they don't give any quantitative. Uh, estimates or results. So it's certainly a big question or important question. Okay, how what is the kind of quantitative dependence on the one hand of the prediction error on the delay depth d? And we've also seen in this numerical example that there was a, a difference for the prediction error depending on the smoothness or the regularity of our observable f. And so, yeah. So, uh, this goes back to your question. In our results, they were for invertible measure preserving transformation, but in general, this the prediction problem you can also state for, for non invertible maps. So, now the question is okay, can we, can we do something for, for non invertible? And uh, and closer related related to the Parkins original paper, uh, yeah. Is there a way to address uh, let's, let's call it the embedding problem of, of making this into a, a one to one correspondence? Uh, and of course, uh, we looked at the uh, linear filter, and okay, there are other prediction algorithms and you could ask, okay, can you prove statements for that? Of course, now this concept that we use of the cyclic vectors, by definition that they look at the linear combinations, linear span, I mean, they seem to really be a good tool for something like a linear filter. Um, so it's not clear if they are of great help for, for other prediction algorithms, but so one has to find some Replacement probably uh, for that. Yeah, so this would be a couple of open directions. So, that's very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Uh, so, regarding uh, the last point, would it make sense to, let's say, talk about the quadratic filter, where you um, take, I don't know, squares of this? Uh, this uh, makes sense. Well, uh, squares of what? Squares of so, so you have this sum C yeah. I F. Now I imagine maybe I throw in some powers. Of the, okay. Of, well, kind of mixed terms maybe or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not aware of it. I mean, I'm not close enough to anything in the optimization. But I mean, I think there is basically. A, 
it will go from this linear regression and then to general non-linear, but I am not aware of anything going from just linear to quadratic or anything. No, no, this is just an example. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I so no, I'm just saying this would be the direction or if you could uh, illustrate what you mean by that. Oh, yeah. oh, no, no, I, I don't have any particular algorithm in mind, but I know that, I mean, so like, uh, 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 Farmer, uh, Sudorovitz. I mean, those are, of course, important algorithms. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if one can do anything in that direction. Uh, but okay, in, in general, for this uh, well, here, I mean, I didn't have any particular algorithm in mind, but I'm just saying that. Okay, Maybe for, for regression tools and so on, maybe we use some, some other uh, algorithms that are in use there. I'm not uh, an expert on that, but it's, it's uh, I mean, yeah. that's, I guess, how I would start in that direction would be kind of to look, okay, what are other uh, tools in the time series analysis uh, beyond the, the linear filter, which is certainly the, the natural first choice and originally the, the First one, and uh, okay, what are other regression tools that you could uh, use? Uh, yeah. But uh, it seems to me that using other regression tools would kind of make a uh, picture much more complicated because here you just shift your vector, you obtain a new vector, and but if you take a square, uh, kind yeah, of no, linear... I mean, okay, this could still be uh, no, because. Is shifting that would still be if you just say okay you want to predict the, the next uh, observation and uh, okay the linear regression okay it's just that you take the linear combination of your mm -hmm. previous d observations and okay you have to find the, the good coefficients to do that yeah. and now if you take a different algorithm then maybe it is not a, a linear uh, combination but <laughs> quadratic one or uh, whatever uh, Relation you would say that. Okay. Then you would also have to look at not only the odd correlation, but like high moments of this of this dependence between variables. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm not, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure that things like the, the cyclic vector and so they will not play this prominent or relevant role there at all because it's. Uh, Other questions? Online, maybe. Uh, I have a question. If you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so I have a question, maybe a little bit about the proof. So, um, this the Stuckel's theorems. They usually somewhere in the proof they use some sort of transversality type argument, which tells you that. Something like if you have an observable which is bad for you, maybe the pre predictability fails, then you have some way of perturbing it in such a way that you can make arbitrary small perturbations such that things begin to work nicely. And I wanted to ask whether it's um, it's possible to isolate this sort of uh, idea also somewhere in your proof. Maybe it's this conjugating with rotation, irrational rotations or or something like this. Uh, okay, could you so uh, which proofs are you talking about? Or uh, well, the, the yeah, the the proof of this main theorem, I guess, yeah. the one that tells you that for a generic uh, system you have a generic set of yes, predictable, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, observables. Okay, but I mean, those this proof is in that sense kind of. Uh, Constructive, but not uh, that it allows you to identify later on a, a nice collection of um, predictable observables. And so it's kind of, uh, no, I mean, it doesn't give us any, any insight or heuristic idea how to pick uh, the um, a good observable, let's say. I mean, it's, right, right. But, but maybe it gives you a way of, you know, saying that if you start with an observable that you can perturb it in such a way that maybe with high probability you end up with a good ah. observable. And I'm interested in what is the, the, the mechanism that gives you that. Ah. If it's possible to, to somehow isolate from the proof. 
No, I'm, I'm afraid uh, it's, it's not really possible because if it's, as you saw at the, at the end of the proof, I mean, it's, it's really this hands-on approach by, okay, you, you want to get this density delta set and you mm -hmm. brutal force you <laughs> write down this intersection of, of sets. Um, but uh, no, I, I don't have... So, I mean, for later on, when we, we looked at this, let's say the rank one systems and uh, for that one, you, you maybe w you get a better idea how to, to pick uh, uh, or how to get the cyclic vector because, I mean, for the rank one systems, I mean, it's basically then that you, you want to take the uh, characteristic uh, function basically of the, of the level, of the base level or, and then I mean, if you take that one, this will certainly uh, give you a, a cyclic vector. So, I mean, for those where we have an explicit description or explicit idea of the transformation T, then maybe you have a, have a chance how to approach, how to produce a, a cyclic vector. But in this general proof in that main theorem, um since i mean basically there's we don't exploit anything of the underlying dynamics i mean this is really just working for for any measure preserving transformation so i, I that looks very hard to me to to identify or get an idea how to about modification steps to to produce a cyclic vector out of a, a given observable let's say mm -hmm. so i'm afraid it's not uh, it's not really uh, intuitive at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. You know, but it would be, of thanks. course, very important if one could do, but uh, yeah. Thank you. I have a question. I don't know if it makes much sense, but uh, here basically you have an action of Z in the space. Uh, does it make sense to consider uh, the expressions of compatibility uh, for? Uh, Actions of uh, other groups. Ah, so for this question on, on cyclic vectors and so, I mean, so from the ergodic theoretic mm -hmm. point of view, I mean, it's certainly an interesting question. But for, uh, yeah, for for the prediction problem, I, I, yeah, Actually, probably hard. Uh, I'm two weeks in Germany and giving a talk because you know, I in uh, 2018 we had a result for ZK. Mm -hmm. And recently we have done it for all books. Oh, very nice. All books. Uh, so I so invite space? you to come to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> oh, online. online. Okay, so what is the okay. result? And it's um, so uh, you have any group action. Okay. So G, you have an X, which is finite dimensional. And now you want to give the conditions so that uh, the um, uh, I don't know how to do the Kappen's map so okay. uh, F, G, yeah, G, okay. X is uh, one to one uh, if that's it. so it's obviously this is uh, this is an uh, intermediate result in the sense that you are um, not considering a finite map but this, let's say this is uh, historically we know that if you have this result, then you, you can get then also the result where you take uh, only a finite element. Finite element? Yeah, so, yeah, so um, the, the natural thing to take is just fg, small gx, where g runs over the whole group and the group is countable. Yeah. But uh, because x is finite dimensional, you know that actually you can cut it. Okay. Okay. Yes, I don't know. Other questions? Let's, let's